Absolutely. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for having me um, and particularly for letting me present on this topic, which is, a you know, as you know, a hot topic in EP and one that many, many people could speak about. Um, I always start by acknowledging my colleagues at UCLA. I'm one of uh, a massive group of people, both clinicians and uh, uh, physician scientists. Um, and here are my uh, disclosures, uh, as well as my, my funding sources. So, you know, when we use the term physiologic pacing, um, what we mean is utilization of some aspect of the heart's conduction system uh, to achieve a narrow QRS um, as best possible. Um, and if you look at this schematic here, hopefully you can see my mouse. Uh, of, you know, the conduction system starting with the atrial bundles that then funnel into the uh, AV node and then become the, the proximal His bundle. Um, and as well as actually this distal uh, His Purkinje system, you can see that there are a wide range of areas that we can target with, uh, you know, uh, pacing leads. And what we're trying to achieve with this really is just to take advantage of the very rapid conduction that you get when you paste the his Purkinje system. Um, if you look over here at this table all the way at the right at numbers four through six, which are the bundle of his, the bundle branches, and the Purkinje network, you get conduction velocities ranging from over a meter per second to four meters per second. So by activating through the his Purkinje system, you can you know, rapidly deliver electrical activation uh, throughout the heart. So, you know, there are many different ways that we can achieve physiologic pacing, as you see from this uh, very nice review here by Pagal. You can do his bundle pacing, you can pace in the RVOT to try to get narrowing. That is contrasted with RV apical pacing. And now folks are doing left bundle branch pacing, as you know, left septal pacing, RV, you know, septal pacing, and many other uh, different approaches. And really, I think virtually anyone who needs pacing can be paced with uh, physiologic pacing, especially if they're going to have a high pacing burden. So that includes uh, a CRT, both left and right bundle uh, branch block, as I'll show you some data, heart block, and also pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. So what I'll try to do over about the next 45 minutes or so is review the rationale for physiologic pacing, talk about his and proximal bundle branch anatomy, implantation approaches, some initial clinical outcomes, talk about mechanisms of QRS narrowing, which for me is, I think, the most exciting part of doing physiologic pacing, which is this idea that you can, uh, you know, narrow Y QRS. Um, and then where, where we go from here. So this is a very EP audience, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the slide. The point of the slide is really just to indicate that many patients need pacing for many different reasons. And uh, pacing obviously has a mortality benefit because if you have a patient who needs pacing, say, for something like heart block and you're not able to do that, that leads to, to loss of life. Although pacing is important and very necessary, we have learned from the David trial that um, it's not so simple. So as you know, the David trial randomized, uh, you know, patients who are receiving an ICD um, into 256, uh, getting a, a pacing mode of uh, VVI-40, so backup pacing, uh, and another, the other group, uh, getting paced at DDDR70. And as you see here, the patients who are in the DDDR70 uh, group had a, a higher incidence uh, of death or you know heart failure hospitalization or, or worsened heart failure, um, and the mortality curves for death for, from any cause was uh, close to significant, not, not quite. And if you look at you know sort of the main you know sort of finding between the two groups is the burden of ventricular pacing. You see that those in the DDDR group were paced at you know, 78% uh, of the time, whereas those in the backup mode pacing only 4% of the time. And that was associated with this, you know, very robust difference in outcomes that I showed you on the slide earlier. And when you dissect further and take away the pacing mode, where you look at those who were paced with the same mode, but those who had a, you know, 
uh, who are paced about 40% of the time versus those who are paced less than 40% of the time, you see again this huge, uh, you know, uh, difference in endpoints, making it clear that a high pacing burden is not a good thing, especially if you're pacing from the RV apex. And it's not a mystery why. Uh, if you look at LV strain, uh, you know, using echocardiography and look at synchrony. Uh, here on the left-hand side, you can see what that looks like in a, a normal patient where, with a normal sinus rhythm, and you can see that the, the you know, the, the different regions here all essentially look fairly uniform uh, versus a patient with left bundle branch block pacing, where you see really here that, you know, the, the you know, this, a, a loss of synchrony is, you know, essentially a lot of dyssynchrony. And especially if you superimpose heart failure on top of that, um, it looks even worse. So this is what RV apical pacing does. It mimics uh, this uh, dyssynchrony, and, and therefore, uh, this is why physiologic pacing has, has uh, come about. To summarize this initial part, again, we've talked about pacing being necessary, life-saving, but a high pacing burden is associated with adverse outcomes. And that's likely due to you know, abnormal myocardial activation, poor energetic use, and abnormal uh, LV pressures, developed pressures. And physiologic pacing uh, enters the picture. So no real talk about physiologic pacing can you know, uh, go on without really mentioning the work of Ben Sherlock, who was really the person that described uh, his bundle pacing uh, as far back as 1968, if I uh, remember correctly, it was when I think his paper was published. And you can see here uh, tracing from that paper where he showed what the QRS looks like in normal sinus rhythm. And with his bundle pacing, as you see here, the uh, pacing stimulus is here, PI pacing impulse, that looks identical to sinus and also looks just like atrial pacing. And before moving on from there, I'll go back in time and just talk very briefly about uh, Wilhelm uh, Hiss. Uh, this is uh, Hiss Sr., not a uh, junior for whom the Hiss bundle is made, but the story really starts with him. Uh, he was a well-known uh, anatomist in the uh, 1800s, and he was very interested in embryologic uh, development. He actually was credited with building the first microtome, and he really pushed the use of uh, microphotography in anatomical research. And when he looked at cardiac development, he was very interested in this region called the atrioventricular canal. Um, and for whatever reason, he never pursued this himself, but he encouraged his son uh, to do so. So this is uh, Wilhelm Hiss Jr., uh, for whom the Hiss bundle is named. And he was the third of uh, his senior's children. And because his father was a well-known scientist and anatomist, he trained at the best institutions at the time. and you know, like a good son, did what his dad told him and uh, focused on this uh, AV canal. And, you know, went on to describe describe it and describe the develop, you know, the embryo embryologic development of this area. But, you know, it, it, while it gained traction, it wasn't really until Sanal Tawara really actually described the distal conduction system. So the left bundle branch and then the, the his Purkinje fibers that the real role for the HIS bundle actually, you know, became clear and, and made sense. So Sanal Tawar is, of course, uh, credited with uh, describing the uh, left bundle, and here's actually his original uh, depiction here that uh, uh, included the, the HIS bundle as well as the, the left uh, and right bundles. So that's really how the anatomic region was, uh, you know, uh, described. The anatomy of the HIS bundle itself uh, requires uh, uh, getting into. Uh, as you know, the HIS runs uh, along the border in general uh, of, between the uh, membranous and muscular septum. Uh, here's the uh, atrioventricular uh, portion of the uh, proximal uh, membranous septum. This is you know, where you get a Gerbody defect uh, if there were to be a perforation here. And then this is the, uh, you know, the right and left ventricular uh, portion of that uh, membrane septum. So the His bundle runs along that uh, crest again between where the membrane septum and the uh, muscular septum meet. Uh, this is a view, uh, this is from Marcel Elizari. Uh, this is a view from the uh, left side now where uh, this is the, uh, where the tricuspid 
leaflet comes in uh, to the septum, septal aspects of tricuspid leaflet. And you see here uh, that, you know, so the head would be up here, the, you know, foot's down here, uh, head's up here, foot down here, excuse me. And here's the AV node, proximal his bundle, and here's where the left bundle comes off. It comes off like a curtain, and then uh, the entire conduction system continues on as a right bundle. I think most people think that the left and right bundle split, but it's really, uh, here's another image of that. It's more like the left bundle comes off as a curtain, and the his bundle is therefore divided into the uh, penetrating, uh, the common, uh, the common, which is the penetrating portion of the his bundle, uh, where it crosses the uh, central fibrous body, and then the branching portion, uh, branching his bundle and penetrating his bundle. These are just two portions of his bundle. The penetrating portion, as you see here, is about five to 10 millimeters uh, in length. It's right-sided. And the branching portion, again, runs along the interventricular septal crest. This is now on the left side. And this starts right when the left posterior fascicles start to come off. So right here uh, would be the beginning of the uh, branching portion of the His bundle. Now, uh, and then obviously, as you know, divides into the anterior and posterior divisions, uh, which go to supply the papillary muscles. You need that tensor down during contraction and you need uh, electrical activation to get there pretty quickly to tent that down before the heart starts to contract. A lot of work has been done describing the uh, various morphological, uh, various anatomical variations that they are uh, in this area. This is just to, to show, show some of that. And I will uh, I think I've made this point pretty clear. I think just that, again, the uh, his bundle is running sort of right here along the crest of the uh, you know, muscular uh, septum up here and then, um, excuse me, the membrane septum up here and the muscular septum down here. So coming back to the development of his bundle pacing, again, I talked about the work of uh, Dr. Ben Sherlag. The studies were then uh, extended uh, by Dr. Sherlag and other colleagues like Nabil El-Sharif and Ralph Lazara and Chris Windham where they found that if you looked at a patient with left bundle branch block, and you paste the, uh, you know, the uh, proximal aspect of the His bundle, uh, you don't correct that. You still have the white curves, but if you paste the distal aspect, you actually get this nice narrowing that you see here. Again, pacing uh, the proximal aspect, pacing, pacing distal aspect. And this is where the concept of narrowing the QRS by pacing the distal His bundle uh, really arose. Uh, this was done uh, in animals uh, initially and then followed up in, in humans. And in terms of, you know, improvement uh, in, in synchrony, uh, an example uh, is shown here uh, from work by Kronborg uh, uh, and, and some colleagues back in 2012, where they looked at parahesian pacing and RV uh, uh, apical pacing. Uh, and you see here, I think uh, green is the uh, basal uh, septum of the LV, and yellow is the basal lateral wall of the LV. And you see here that in the same patient with parahisian pacing, uh, both regions reach their peak uh, systolic uh, uh, contract contraction at the same time. Whereas if you paste the RV, this is that dyssynchrony that we're talking about. And they do this in a whole bunch of patients uh, and show that almost no matter what the index you look at, pacing from the RV septum uh, was associated with worse cardiac contractility and systolic function uh, compared to the parahisian region. That work was extended by Dan Lustgarden, who did this uh, really nice, again, class, classic study here of uh, looking at his bundle pacing versus biventricular pacing, and he did this in a crossover design where he took uh, the same patients had both a uh, CS lead uh, and uh, the um, and a his bundle lead, and was able to compare in, in the same patients what their EF quality of life NYHA class and six minute hall walk test looked like with his bundle pacing and biventricular pacing, and basically showed equivalence uh, between the two. Again, suggesting that QRS narrowing in this population afforded the same benefits that we have come to associate with resynchronization therapy. So this was really a, a landmark study uh, that I think really opened this area up and drew a lot of interest into this. Obviously, other people have, uh, done, have done work before this, but I think this study was one that really brought this to the forefront.
Um, I'll get into some more studies a little bit later. I want to segue a little bit and talk about uh, lead implantation approaches. The probably and not to necessarily endorse uh, any company, probably the most commonly used approaches uh, with the uh, Medtronic uh, system where we use the 3830 lead, the Select Secure lead, which is a luminous lead with one of a number of catheters. Uh, uh, these here are the preformed uh, his catheters, C315 family, and also there are two deflectable uh, sheets that uh, can be used as well. And just as a, a point of uh, a mention here that uh, all the other companies are now coming up with uh, sheets mostly, uh, but although Boston Scientific is uh, pushing a, a lead that's almost like a 3830 lead, uh, except that uh, it does have a lumen, a uh, pretty small lead. A quick primer on uh, the approach. Um, I won't spend too much time on this because there are now many, many videos available uh, online that uh, from many people uh, that show how to do this. This is from one of our early cases. This is probably one of my first uh, handful of cases uh, where we were using a, a CRD2 to mark the position of the HIST, but in general, uh, we do a left uh, venogram um, before getting access, get access, and then we put up this uh, lead from the um, from the from the groin, uh, and then drop our wires. Uh, in this case, which was a CRTD case, uh, put in the RV uh, defibrillator lead, drop the RA lead into the IVC, and then begin to work to position the uh, the his bundle lead. Um, and here's uh, showing uh, the lead with uh, our uh, uh, sheep here. Um, here's a uh, what we see on the um, the programmers. Uh, you can see here a nice uh, P wave, and then the His bundle electrogram, and then the the QRS. And again, what you're aiming for is uh, the distal aspect of the His bundle. So you do expect to have a you know a very big um, ventricular deflection, definitely much bigger than uh, than than atrial, which tells you in the distal His. Um, and then we take this uh, position, and this is what it looks like after we, we screwed it in. I think this was the initial um, uh, 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 tracing here, initial electrograms. And then once we secure the lead, this is what it looked like at the end. Um, and then we essentially you know, pull back the, the sheath, uh, lead stays in place, um, and then pull everything back and secure the device. And this is how I did this initially when I started. Uh, now I you know, typically don't use a, um, a CRD2 from the leg, I really just go up uh, from the, um, you know, left upper extremity venous system with, uh, with the sheet. And, you know, here what uh, typical settings look like. I, the point I want to, what I would like to point out um, on this slide is really just how uh, making the distinction between the HIS capture threshold and the local capture. So in this case, with the HIS lead, we uh, captured, we lost HIS, the threshold for HIS capture was actually three uh, uh, volts here, as you see at uh, 0.5 millisecond pulse width, and then the local capture was lost at one. And, you know, this is what has dogged uh, HIS bundle pacing, um, uh, is, uh, the, you know, the fact that you have these high thresholds that uh, could drain battery life. And I'll get into some of uh, ways of potentially avoiding that uh, shortly. Um, and when we talk about Brady pacing, uh, the his bundle uh, lead is set just like you would uh, RV apical pacing. In terms of terminology, so this is one of our, our early cases, a patient with uh, depressed LVEF, ischemic cardiomyopathy, had a prolonged HV and QRS of 200 milliseconds. And with his bundle pacing, we were able to, to uh, narrow completely to 99 milliseconds. Um, and this would be uh, called uh, selective uh, capture here. So selective capture, there were a number of terms that were used uh, previously until uh, a paper about four or five years ago agreed to use uh, consistent terms. So these days we tend to favor use of the term selective his capture and non-selective his capture. In the past, things like, you know, pure and direct and parahysin and all these terms were used. And selective capture just means that you are getting exactly the, the his bundle and very little to no local myocardial tissue. So you do get what looks like an HV interval as shown here. And then non-selective capture means that you do capture 
some local myocardium in addition to the His bundle, and then you get what looks like a delta wave which reflects that local myocardial capture. Most cases of His bundle pacing are non-selective uh, His capture, but that's still associated with significant, uh, significantly improved outcomes. This was my very first uh, His bundle case here, a uh, 74-year-old uh, uh, woman who had um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and underwent uh, AVR and septomyomectomy and then initially had heart block, which resolved, but she was left with a pretty wide left bundle branch block. Over six months, her EF dropped, her NYHA class increased, and she went from having only exertional dyspnea to dyspnea at rest. She'd been optimized on medications and uh, obviously met class one indications for CRTD. At this point, this was one of our, as I mentioned, my, my very first case. Uh, we explained to her that, you know, his bundle pacing is new, but, you know, had, you know, potential benefits, including a more natural activation of the, you know, the, the cardiac induction system, and she agreed to it. And this was her case here. Again, you see here CRD2 from the groin. This is uh, the, her um, uh, aortic valve here, uh, CRHV interval was 64 milliseconds measured. And this is what we got with her. Again, big uh, ventricular potential here. You can see the His bundle electrogram here. Uh, we secured uh, here, and we actually ended up with non-selective pacing, uh, non-selective His bundle capture, as you see here. We did narrow her QRS from 198 milliseconds to 123, which wasn't perfect. We hoped we could completely normalize it. But even with that, just improving to 123 and not complete normalization, her EF went from 15% to 55%. And uh, this was my first case again now about six or seven years ago. Uh, and she's still doing really well today. till today. She's now seen by one of my partners. And, you know, this really got us going on this. This led us to, you know, design this study here. I mentioned that Dan Lutzgarten had use a crossover approach uh, to examine the feasibility of uh, his bundle pacing. Uh, we put our series together where we looked at uh, patients where we just used his bundle pacing lead alone for CRT uh, to assess the feasibility uh, of that. And we took patients who had indication for CRT, either they had failed CS lead or sub suboptimal coronary venous targets, or a few, a handful of patients who opted for his bundle pacing from the start. We recruited about 17 patients. We were unsuccessful in four. And of the 13 that got the lead here, there are characteristics here. Uh, you see that we had a pretty wide QRS, again, about 180 milliseconds. And here were our results here. Again, this is now published. We're able to narrow the QRS significantly from uh, about one 75 plus or minus 30 to 122, uh, most mean narrowing about 53 milliseconds uh, in most patients, which again, you don't, may not see as often with, uh, you know, the traditional coronary sinus pacing. Here again, our uh, uh, selective versus non-selective, most of our patients were non-selective capture, and even with that, uh, you saw the EF substantially improved, the LV internal dimension and diastole also significantly improved. And one thing that was interesting that we saw was that the wider the QRS, the greater the narrowing that we saw. Uh, this hasn't been replicated um, as often in the in the other studies, but we thought this was really quite interesting. And here are outcomes. Uh, we did have one patient that uh, had a pneumonia and passed away uh, shortly after the uh, implant, and another uh, got septic and actually needed device explant patient, but all the other patients doing pretty well with no arrhythmias or shocks um, in the uh, one-year uh, follow-up uh, that, we, that we had. So switching gears to mechanism here, uh, to me, again, this is one of the most exciting parts of uh, his bundle pacing is how does it work? How do we narrow the QRS in, in his bundle pacing? And we put together this review a few years ago uh, with a... Uh, a resident of mine who's now a fellow at UCSF, where we sort of reviewed uh, all what has been uh, noted in terms of how his bundle pacing manages to narrow the QRS. And the predominant concept is uh, this idea of longitudinal dissociation, the idea that 
fibers that will become the you know right or left bundle are predestined uh, within the HIS, and so that if you get block in within the HIS uh, in the fibers that will be going to become the uh, left bundle, then you would get left bundle branch block. And the idea is that if you then uh, pace in this region, um, either by pacing at very high outputs, you can get a larger area of capture, or pacing beyond the site of block as shown here, you can then uh, narrow that QRS. And we go on to show the different uh, pacing waveforms that you can get here. But the, again, predominant concept is this idea of longitudinal dissociation. And, and speaking with Ben Sherlock, who published the initial paper on the concept, it, it, it doesn't quite work as well in diseased uh, tissue. Uh, but if you acutely put in a lesion in the left bundle, uh, as they did in normal animals, it, it made sense. So there's some idea that this may not completely explain all cases, but at least this is the, the best that we have uh, at this point. And here's another image of that. Here's actually an, a, an image of the uh, proximal his bundle region. And you can see here again, uh, these tracks uh, here um, uh, that you know go through. So in pink here, that's the tissue. And then the, uh, the excuse me, the, the, yeah, the pink here is the uh, his uh, tissue conduction system tissue, and then blue here is the uh, central fibrous body, and you see it penetrating here. So work by uh, Rod Tong and, and Gaurav at University of Chicago was very, very helpful in helping us understand a couple of things. One, potentially how to select patients for his bundle pacing, and two, the potential mechanisms of, of narrowing. So what they did was in a whole bunch of patients, some of who did not necessarily need his bundle pacing, uh, they mapped the right and left sides of the uh, septum. And essentially, we're able to identify patients with uh, intrahistian blocks. So this might be more akin to that longitudinal dissociation that I mentioned versus patient who had block uh, more within left bundle. Uh, so this would be true left bundle branch block versus patients who had intact uh, his for Kinji activation. And this might indicate that this is more nonspecific IVCD or some other uh, mechanism for widening QRS, maybe just uh, severely diseased hearts with very poor muscle-to-muscle -muscle conduction. And what they showed is that the more proximal the block, so the patients that had left intrahistian block, which were 46% of the patients, you were able to narrow the QRS in 94% of those patients. Whereas in patients with left bundle branch block, uh, that was more within the left bundle. They had that was 18% of their patients. You could narrow in fewer of those patients, 62%. Whereas in those with more distal block, you could not narrow any of those patients at all. Which, in a way, is you know tells us what we sort of already knew. But again, just the idea that block can be in the proximal left bundle or can be in the his bundle. And, this makes sense for why we're not doing while we are now doing left bundle branch area pacing, which I'll get into just a little bit here. Some other really interesting concepts with uh, regards to his bundle pacing. This is data from Parikh Sharma. Uh, next to you got your your neighbor there in uh, Chicago, uh, who looked at uh, his bundle pacing for CRT in patients with right bundle branch block. All the data I've shown you. Uh, till this point has really uh, been in left bundle. And they showed that indeed you can narrow the QRS even in right bundle branch block. They had a narrowing of about 158 to 127. And in their patients, whether they were severely uh, low EF or all, or you know modestly low EF or all comers, you see EF improvement uh, in all of their patients. And you know these are kind of their uh, patient characteristics uh, here. So his bundle, used for right bundle branch block. Again, uh, I thought this was a very exciting study uh, in that it shows that uh, it wasn't just the left bundle branch that can be narrowed. You can also do that for right bundle. And patients, as you know, with right bundle branch block and heart failure, uh, traditional CRT with a coronary sinus lead doesn't really help those patients. So the idea of being able to do this, um, I think, uh, was really, really quite interesting and a great contribution. The other area where this, I, I think, is interesting is in AV node ablation. Um, and, you know, 
the way that I, I'm not sure how most people do their AV node ablations with, with pacing, the way we typically we tend to do it is to put the lead in first um, and then come back and ablate later uh, just to make sure that the lead is healed into place appropriately. And uh, you see here in this paper from Fugao where uh, they were showed here the sites around the his bundle lead where they ablated. You might be worried that, you know, by ablating so close to the lead, you might dislodge it and, you know, what if something happens, but uh, that actually didn't happen. And I've done several of these cases myself, and it really does look like you're ablating right on the, on the his bundle uh, lead, which is a little nerve wracking, but uh, that tends to be pretty safe. And so here's a fluoroscopic image of that. Again, if you look at uh, you know, projections here of where you're ablating, I mean, it looks again like you're right on the lead and you might be worried about damaging uh, the lead. But they showed in this one patient here who, uh, you know, uh, had pacing induced, uh, excuse me, who had tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, um, you could again achieve a very narrow QRS uh, with um, AV node ablation and his bundle pacing. And they showed here 19 months follow up, very, you know, essentially very stable lead positions, no change in the QRS duration here, as you see. And, you know, some increase in the lead threshold, again, a known uh, issue with uh, his bundle pacing and stable to slightly improved um, LVEF, as you see here in functional class. Now, you know, we're always taught that. You know, if a patient has advanced conduction system disease and you start pacing uh, that ventricle, that the remaining wisps of uh, fibers in the conduction system essentially go away uh, or that you, you lose that. Um, and this paper was really nice in showing that that's not necessarily the case. So what they did here uh, were to look, you know, was to look at his bundle pacing in patients with long-standing AV block and chronic right ventricular pacing. Again, the patients that you would expect would, that you could no longer find a hiss or any aspect of the conduction system. Uh, and here's an example of one of those cases. You see here the PACE QRS in this uh, uh, patient who'd had complete AV block for eight years. So she'd been PACE for eight years uh, and developed pacing induced cardiomyopathy. And with uh, careful mapping, um, uh, PACE mapping here, they were able to identify a site and capture there led to non selective. Uh, uh, capture uh, of the HIST and narrow the QRS dramatically. And they uh, showed in their series of, of 60 patients that, you know, uh, with some patients, again, look at the duration of RV pacing here out to 80 months, that you could substantially narrow the QRS. You see, look at the difference here between uh, the RV pacing uh, QRS and, and HIST bundle QRS, substantially narrow the QRS and improve LV function. So you know, uh, really nice study showing that, you know, we can't, we shouldn't just give up on patients who've been pacing for a long time and uh, his bundle uh, pacing still potentially has a role um, in these patients. In one patient, they've been pacing for up to 22 years. So, I mean, this is really remarkable that someone took the time to really map out the conduction system and, and pace this patient. So this is, again, yet uh, uh, an impressive study. And looking across at all the studies, uh, this has probably been, been updated by now, uh, you know, about eight or so studies here, uh, the looking at when the studies were published, uh, the implant, implant success rates and the types of leads that were used. And you see that uh, in general, uh, success rates with his bundle pacing is high, and you tend to uh, get substantial improvement uh, in the LV function, uh, as you see here. So really exciting way to move forward. Now, I'll spend a little bit of time on left bundle branch block pacing. As uh, I mentioned, his bundle pacing is associated with high uh, pacing thresholds. Uh, sometimes you don't get QRS narrowing. As I showed you in the paper from uh, Gaurav Upadhyay and, and Rod Tung, you can actually have block in the proximal left bundle. So his bundle pacing would not correct those patients, right? You could also have infranodal AV block, and there are issues with lead stability and, and again, thresholds over time. And so this was really developed by Wei Zhang Huang uh, out of China, also a big uh, his bundle pacing, uh, you know, expert. Uh, and he's been doing this for some time, actually. He 
I remember would always put in his, his, his lead and then go distal to that to see if he can find a better site. And he kept going distally until he actually started borrowing into the septum and pacing the left bundle branch. And that's where left bundle branch area pacing came from. And he's written uh, with Bogal this uh, very nice um, uh, piece here uh, in Heart Rhythm about a hands-on approach. Um, they, I'll actually show it. I think it's easier to see on this uh, slide here. Uh, they look for this W pattern. So uh, here's an example in their recently published uh, a series, multi-center series, where they look prospectively at patients with a left bundle branch block and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Here are the patient characteristics you see here. And so in these patients, you see this is the native uh, QRS here. And when you, uh, and panel B here is uh, actually pacing the septum, so not quite capturing the uh, uh, conduction uh, system tissue. And you see this W pattern here, which is sort of what they look for. And then by burrowing deeper and deeper into the septum, you see this progressive change here. And all of a sudden, you get to a point where your stem to uh, PQRS actually narrows. Uh, and that tells you that you uh, have captured uh, the left bundle. Uh, branch. They actually captured it here, but there was some output dependence. So by increasing from three volts to five volts, they were able to actually get uh, more selective capture of the, the left bundle branch, as you see here, uh, and you see substantial QRS narrowing. And, you know, in their study, they uh, went from about a mean of uh, 165 milliseconds with left bundle branch. Uh, pacing to uh, QRS of 104 milliseconds. And here are their patient outcomes here. Again, uh, at six months and at 12 months, increase in uh, LVEF uh, and re reduction in LV uh, and systolic volume. Again, showing that you do get with left bundle branch pacing, you get that uh, reverse remodeling that you saw with his bundle pacing. So, now we have these two approaches, uh, his bundle pacing, left bundle branch, block, uh, left bundle branch area pacing. How do you pick? Um, I thought this perspectives and contrast uh, between Ken uh, uh, Ellenbogen and, and Santosh Padal at VCU and Gaurav and Rod um, at uh, U of Chicago was a really nice way of overview of looking at uh, both. I mean, at the time that this was published, there was only one uh, study with outcomes out to 12 months uh, with left bundle branch area pacing, and that was Wei Zhang Wang's paper. So there was no experience outside of China uh, at that point. But they very you know, nicely, if you look at the, on this right side of the screen here, the paper from Ken and Santosh very nicely actually looks at, in terms of the differences between the two, anatomy, histology, physiology, et cetera. But I think, one way of, of a nice way of summarizing the potential issues with uh, left bundle branch area pacing, I think was nicely captured here, where you know Gaurav and 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 Rod essentially outlined that at this point there's of course a lot more data for his bundle pacing than left bundle branch area pacing, and some of the advantages for his bundle pacing. Um, you know, are that you can completely recruit um, intrinsic left conduction system activation. So again, by pacing and recruiting native conduction within the HIS bundle, you are getting both uh, bundle branches. There's obviously, there was at, at least at the time this was written, uh, much more evidence for HIS bundle pacing. And at that point, again, we don't didn't know as much about left bundle branch area pacing. So the criteria weren't uh, as developed and, you know, the generalizability was, you know, unknown or unclear. Um, now with the paper that I just showed uh, one slide before this, which is a multi-center study um, and international uh, study, we now have more data outside of China with left bundle branch area pacing. So the way I think it's going to likely boil down is that most people will try uh, his bundle branch, uh, excuse me, his bundle pacing first. Um, and if you don't get, you know, QRS narrowing or uh, complete QRS narrowing, you might try, you know, left bundle branch area pacing and see 
you know, if you narrow it completely there. Of course, that takes time. That's more radiation exposure, exposure, um, et cetera. So it remains to be seen how people will use these two techniques. And, you know, uh, it, when we have better tools as well that allow us to, you know, get into the conduction system more reliably uh, and, and, and faster, I think that that may also also change. Um, as I wrap up here, I'll just, you know, call your attention to this nice uh, compendium that was published, uh, well, now four years ago in the Journal of Electrocardiology, Electrocardiology where uh, a number of different folks contributed, uh, you know, different uh, articles to the concepts of uh, his bundle pacing, including anatomy, physiology, um, et cetera. Uh, one point to mention is that phys physiologic pacing or his bundle pacing Pacing is now making it into the guidelines, again, uh, class 2A and 2B for patients with AV block who have an indication for permanent pacing and EF between 36 and 50 percent that you expect to pace more than 40 percent of the time. Again, this was from uh, the David uh, 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 sub-study here uh, that you can consider his bundle pacing. Um, and then class 2B in patients with AV block at the level of the AV node um, that you Obviously, they have an indication for permanent pacing. You may consider his bundle pacing to maintain physiologic ventricle activation. And I think that over time, as more data come out and more people use this, this is likely to rise in, the, in terms of guidelines. Uh, lots of studies in the works. Uh, this is a search from today. Every time I give a his bundle talk, I, I uh, update this. These are a number of studies that are actively recruiting for his bundle pacing and left bundle branch area pacing, so again, more data uh, will be uh, forthcoming. So to conclude, physiologic pacing is an important option for many pacing indications, including uh, for synchronization. It's associated with significant clinical and cardiac structural improvement. And of course, this is especially true in patients who need pacing and have depressed LV function. The mechanisms of QRS narrowing, which again, I think are just fascinating, are uh, incompletely understood, but I think over time, as we learn more and more, I think that we this will, uh, one, teach us not only what bundle branch block is or what conduction block really means, I think that it will also expand our use of physiologic pacing. Uh, the next point is just to, you know, again, highlight that this is now making it into the, you know, uh, clinical guidelines for, for pacing. And as we get more and more tools, again, being developed and, and you know, get smarter about using this, I think that, you know, uh, more patients will derive benefits from uh, physiologic pacing. So with that, I'll go ahead and stop and again, acknowledge my UCLA colleagues and my funding sources, and I will be glad to take questions. All right, thanks, Olu, that was great. A um, few questions maybe I could ask. Maybe you could just clarify, um, you know, when, when you're putting in a his bundle lead, uh, selective versus non-selective capture, do you make an effort to get one versus the other? Does it not really matter? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I, I used to have a slide, um, you know, that uh, was actually put together by uh, Siva Mopuru from uh, Mayo, where he actually, you know, showed the different sort of anatomic, you know, sort of uh, uh, locations of the HIS bundle running over the crest of that uh, muscular septum. So the his bundle can be pretty superficial. They call that the naked his bundle or can be buried very deep. So even if you try as hard as you can for those situations where the his bundle is very deep or you almost always capture some local myocardium. So what I do is I, I look for as much QRS narrowing as I can get. And I don't really care so much about whether it's selective or non-selective. I, of course, go in looking for selective, but after you've been in there for a little while, I think you're just happy to get something that's much narrow and, and that's better for the patient. And are there any um, patients that you, what patient characteristics do you use to decide on physiologic pacing versus putting in an apical lead? Yeah, so that that's also, also a good question. I, you know, I think in general, if you're, going to have a patient who is going to pace a lot, I start to think about physiologic pacing uh, in those patients. Of course, if it's a much 
older patient that, you know, uh, you know, you may not want to have them on the table for too long, then, you know, I think that we, you know, I may not necessarily uh, uh, pursue, you know, a spinal pacing, especially if it's taking too long. But in, in general, I try to uh, use his bundle pacing or physiologic pacing in any patient that I think is going to pace a lot. Um, and that's, you know, my, my very simple criteria. And I, I tend to use his bundle pacing more for CRT because uh, I you know, personally just have more of an interest in that. I think it's fascinating that, you know, again, we can narrow the QRS, uh, you know, with uh, physiologic pacing, with his bundle pacing. But, you know, to answer your question directly, it's, it's more so pacing bird. And then I guess on the heels of that comment, so your thought process for CRT, do you start with the LV lead? Do you start with his lead and then move to left bundle? How do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I'm actually quite aggressive with physiologic pacing. I, I pretty much every single patient of mine who is a resynchronization patient uh, is approached with uh, physiologic pacing. I mean, it's uh, what I tell the patient, it's the discussion we have um, in clinic or in the hospital before the, the procedure. And I tell them that if I cannot, you know, get, if I cannot narrow the QRS with physiologic pacing, then I do uh, coronary sinus lead. And, you know, of course that can lead to slightly longer procedures, but I believe that this truly is what's better for the patient. They are, you know, the heart was never meant to be activated from the epicardium as we get with the, you know, coronary sinus lead. So, and, and, you know, so I think that, you know, for that reason, and I'm sure you're familiar with data uh, where patients with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, especially those with uh, lateral scar, can actually get VT from uh, epicardial uh, pacing in terms of coronary sinus. So I, I pretty much off the bat plan to do physiologic pacing and only if his bundle and left bundle branch uh, area of pacing fail do I do a coronary sinus lead. Okay, and then uh, I guess uh, my last question, um, what tools are you most excited about coming out in this field? Yeah, I, hopefully this isn't seen as an endorsement of any particular company, but I'm, I'm, uh, I've seen and played around a little bit with the, uh, the Abbott His Pro uh, sheath, the deflectible. I'm not sure if you have it at your center. We actually don't have it at UCLA yet, uh, but you know, I think the idea of being able to, uh, you know, map with the same sheet that you're going to deploy the lead with, I think I, you know, is, uh, I'm excited uh, by that. And the fact that, you know, it's, it's deflectible. So I, I'd say that's, you know, again, this is not a particular endorsement. You know, I think that, again, I know Biotronic is coming out very soon. I think uh, they're about half a year out with their preformed uh, sheets. And I know Boston has their uh, uh, set of sheets out. Uh, as well, but the the ability to map with the with the and and you know because what that's going to do is it's going to really help you for those patients where either you know maybe they've been chronically paced and you're not you know there's no anti-grade conduction so you can't find a hiss uh, that might help you with those patients. 